Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Piotr Alexeyev. I'm working as a researcher in the Department of Distributed Systems. And uh, you can find my, my contact information by following this link on this slide. And uh, if you want to contact me later, just feel free to ask me or visit my office if you wish. And today, uh, I'm, I'm going to present you some sort of guest lecture. That's why I I, I have to tell you something about uh, the research, current research activities in the uh, real-time systems, software real-time systems. And uh, this lecture will not be very tough. Uh, this, is, will, this lecture will be more or less um, free. It will not be overloaded with very, very complicated formulas. So this will be uh, some sort of uh, research in uh, real-time systems in a nutshell. So, uh, let me show you the agenda of the current lecture. We will start from the classic real-time theory, which you are, have to be familiar with because of the previous lectures, the previous information concerning about this course was about the classic real-time theory. And uh, we'll take some, some basic uh, information about this theory in a nutshell. And, uh, I will try to highlight the disadvantages of this approach and why there is supposed to be something not really classic, something going beyond of classic real-time theory of real-time systems. And I would start with an uh, estimation of worst-case execution time problem because uh, it might look like there is no such problem at all because we can basically estimate uh, execution time of your software by basically executing it. But unfortunately, I will show you this is not very, very safe approximation. And how to deal with this and what can be done uh, in this case, I can present you during this, this, uh, this section of the, of the lecture. Uh, the probably most interesting section is non-classic real-time approaches, uh, where I'm going to show you some uh, some approaches what are actually evolving in, in real-time systems theory, going beyond classical limit, limits and uh, going, going in advance. I can show you, I can say what uh, these, these approaches, they are connected to, with, with uh, uh, crowd theory and using some verification tools. And I'm going to show you some of these tools, in particular, uh, true uh, times tool, uh, OPAL, and uh, one particular tool for Petri networks. And I'm going to finish with a section of some, some basic research case, uh, which is uh, connected to your now classic theory of real-time systems, uh, of earliest deadline as late as possible scheduling algorithm. You're probably already faced with this algorithm when you are uh, uh, discussing uh, some uh, issues of scheduling both periodic and non-periodic tasks. So I will, I, will, I will show you how this was developed and what was uh, developed later as a result of this, of this particular uh, LS deadline as late as possible scheduling algorithm. So let me start with classic real-time theory just to summarize what's going on in this, uh, in this approach of real-time systems. And uh, maybe this might look even as a basic summary of, of all of your course, maybe a bit in advance, but still. What is a real-time software? What is a real-time system? Uh, actually, there is a, some sort of physical process in a plant somewhere. This might be everything you previously discussed with the previous lecture. So, well, an example might be some sort of uh, airplane flight. This might be something from the nuclear plant or doesn't matter. Uh, this is physical process. Uh, so, uh, it should be managed with particular timing constraints and uh, going beyond these constraints is not tolerated. So, if the system will will respond on some some required inquiries with delays uh, bigger than the de specified deadline. The system might be ruined, or 
for example, this system will be not needed anymore. So this is the some sort of description of a uh, real-time system. So how the software of uh, such real-time system is composed? It's composed from several tasks. Uh, so what is a task? I'm asking you. You probably already know. What's the task? Okay, smile, smile. <laughs> it's a definition of some uh, elements of your code, like a function or several functions that have to be executed. So several tasks define several functionality that have to be executed simultaneously or like simultaneously in your system because it should uh, reply to sensors and provide actuators with data in particular time without uh, big uh, latentness. So it should respond on requires with a certain time, not going beyond the deadline. That's how it works. That's the real-time software in a nutshell. What can you say about these tasks? What can you say? Uh, you can say that there are three, three different uh, types of these tasks. The basic type is periodic task. So the task, what was executed, um, several times, so continuously during the execution of your real-time system with a certain period. And this period will not change during the execution. What if this period is violating or changing? This task is sporadic task. It may be seen, uh, saying like uh, this task might be executed again, but no one knows if it will be executed after a certain time. But the only one difference is uh, that this task will not be executed before, it will not be activated before some certain period of time before it, after its previous execution. So this is called so-called minimal period for sporadic task. And there is a sort of aperiodic task that might be executed only one time during the execution of your real-time system, it might be executed several times, but without any certain period of time. Um, what is a job or task instance? It's an execution of a task. So if uh, we will go to the software development technology issues, uh, we can say that we can approximately can say what the task is a definition of some sort of function and the job or a task instance is an execution, particular execution at this particular time of this particular task. So each task can uh, define uh, some sort of function which can be executed several times and each this time will be a job or task instance. Uh, each task has uh, some timing parameters in uh, classic real-time uh, real systems uh, theory. For, for example, an execution time or computation time. So this is the time. It also may be called worst case execution time. It's a maximum time required for this task to be executed without other task being executed. So another mandatory, uh, mandatory parameter of task is deadline, because if we will not have a deadline, <laughs> this is not a real-time system. Yes? Uh, uh, there might be some other additional parameters like an offset or initial phase or activation time or start time or finish time. Some, there might be a very, very big amount of these parameters, time and parameters for, for tasks. So I'm not going to enumerate all of these parameters. Perhaps you already know all of them. Or, or it's not a big problem to, to, to got, get it from, from the literature. And for example, I can show you uh, with this slide, how how this uh, how these parameters might be might be defined for one particular uh, uh, example of periodic task. So we, ha we have a task. This what is it? This arrow. Yes, it's a release. It's it's uh, the time when this task should be started. So it it became ready for execution. Is this task going to be executed immediately after this time? Is it obligatory that this task will be executed immediately? No, because of preemption, of course, because we may have, 
more more uh, preemptive uh, tasks with higher priority, and, and they will be still executed. The task execution might be stopped for a while or postponed for a while, while while other tasks with higher priority being executed. Uh, the period usually defined with T or with P. It depends. In different literature, it might be defined a bit differently. This is the initial phase or initial offset. So it's some sort of start of the first period of this execution task. And uh, this, this time, uh, this might be also defined as an additional uh, phase of this task. What else can we say? This task is executed periodically. This arrow down is uh, some sort of deadline. A deadline might, and, and some other parameters of task, if it's periodic task, might be absolute or relative, right? So probably it's not a big problem for you. So, right. And uh, what can we do with all of these parameters? So what is the basically task? What is the basically uh, idea of classic real-time theory? We have a task set where each task is a, just a compilation, is a combination of all of these time and parameters. And what is our task in this case? We have to provide some sort of schedule which allows to execute all of these tasks without missing their deadlines, right? And what's already has been done, what was already proposed, you have some patterns of solution for solution of this particular task. Well, the first one shown here, it's probably the most cited paper in the real-time system theory, is well-known 1973 uh, paper of Liu and uh, Leyland. Uh, this paper defines well-known rate monitoring scheduling, scheduling algorithm and earliest deadline uh, first algorithm. So these two algorithms are well known for many, many years. It's, it's probably already 40 years, quite a long time ago. Now. But this is still valuable. So just imagine how, how good all these offers were. So they are quite, they provided very impressive paper. So they not even provided these algorithms, they also provided a feasibility check rule for for both of these algorithms. For rate monitoring scheduling, what is this rule? How, how can you uh, estimate if particular uh, uh, rate monitoring schedule is feasible? I mean, all task executions, all task instances will meet their deadlines or not. How can you estimate it? this? So you you can uh, you can use uh, CPU utilization factor, and if it below specific value, you can say that this particular task set is uh, execution is feasible, and uh, this is preemptive scheduling when um, priorities of tasks are arranged according to their periods. What's the disadvantage of rate monitoring scheduling? <laughs> It's a basic assumption of rate monotonic scheduling. The deadline is equal to task period. And all tasks are periodic. If just one task is not periodic, this is not feasible. Or maybe not feasible, not safe to say it's feasible. What can you do uh, if uh, your deadlines are not equal to periods, or for example, you have uh, not periodic tasks? You can use EDF, and EDF allows you to reach up to 100% of your CPU utilization factor. Quite nice, yes? But um, is it all what you can say, for example, for rate monotonic scheduling? Was what something later done about rate monotonic scheduling? <laughs> How do you think? Okay, I can ask you in a different way. Is it possible to get a CPU utilization factor about 100% with rate monitoring scheduling with a number of tasks more than one. Someone says no. I would say yes, it's possible. 
It depends on the parameters of your tasks. And well-known uh, well rule, well, then uh, the CPU utilization factor is less than 69%, it's just very pessimistic rule. If your CPU utilization factor with freight monitoring scheduling is less than 69%, whatever happens, it, with, any, uh, with any number of tasks, with any number, uh, with any parameters of this test, you will receive feasible schedule. That's what it says. It's safe, but it's too pessimistic. So you can define the different task setting, you can reach up to 100%. And also I can say what, uh, in particular, if you have just two tasks, you can also reach up, up to 100%. And uh, you can see this rule was defined in 1973, but uh, the combination for two tasks with tight uh, but still, uh, but still uh, safe approximation of CPU utilization factor was defined only uh, 20 or maybe 30 years later after this. So you can see it was defined quite a long time ago, but it's still under development in some, some issues. Uh, what can you say about deadline monotonic scheduling was defined also quite a long time ago? What's the difference between, for example, rate monotonic and deadline monotonic? <coughs> so the ideas are pretty the same. You have uh, just basic, uh, with, with rate monotonic you have, you have an assumption what period is equal to deadline. With deadline monotonic, you can say what period is bigger than deadline, or not not equal to deadline. Let's say it's more, more safe. But how can you you define a feasibility rule for deadline monotonic scheduling? Mm -hmm. Is there any specific formula, like for red monotonic or EDF? No, unfortunately not. Uh, because there's special special technique for defining or recognizing if this particular task set is feasible for deadline one on scheduling or not. And uh, there are some special techniques for this, and one of them, well known, is the response time analysis. It was defined also later. You can see it like 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, yeah, difference. So it involving continuously. Uh, <clears throat> So what is the response time analysis? It's an analysis of specific uh, response time for a particular task instance. So for each task instance, this analysis allows to calculate the worst response time. And if you will define, if you will estimate it, this uh, response time, you just can basically compare it with the deadline and if this response time, I mean the time then the task will be finished finally, is less than deadline, your schedule is feasible. Quite easy. But this also requires a special algorithm to, to, to analyze this particular task set. <coughs> so let, let me come to the conclusion what actually uh, classic real-time scheduling theory allows us to do. Because basically, previously we were talking about well-known scheduling algorithms. You probably discussed them quite quite a lot. <coughs> but classic real-time theory is not limited only to this scheduling for um, you know, for uh, periodic tasks. Well, the feasibility of the schedule is estimated by well-known formulas or algorithms. You know, it in an example of a rate monotonic or EDF or whatever. Uh, is it good uh, for periodic tasks? Well, it's pretty good because classic scheduling theory is extremely good for, for periodic tasks. So you can basically choose uh, possible uh, scheduling schemes, scheduling algorithm for them, and you can basically check if it's possible or not. And, and the rest only depends on your implementation, on your specific system, on the abilities of your real-time operating system and whatever. What can you say about sporadic tasks? Not so good, not so good, because we cannot rely if they will be executed with some sort of period bigger than the minimal period. 
So we have to be pessimistic according to the classic uh, scheduling theory, and we have to assume that they will be treated as almost periodic tasks with the period equal to their minimal period. Not very nice, pessimistic, but safe, right? Safe. And what can we say about aperiodic tasks? Oh, don't like them, don't like them. So we have to use, we have to use uh, well-known algorithms if the task set is composed from aperiodic tasks only. So we can basically just earlier the date or even EDF, because EDF doesn't concern about the periods, right? just concerns about the deadlines. So we can use uh, well-known scheduling algorithm as well. But what if the more realistic task set will be? If the combination of periodic and aperiodic tasks will be there? This is the complicated question. We have to use fixed priority service or dynamic priority service. Uh, so what, is it, what does it mean? This means what we have to, for example, use well-known scheduling skill for periodic tasks, and we have to check if this particular instance of a periodic task can be scheduled without missing the deadline in this particular situation. So we can define, for example, uh, algorithm for acceptance of these tasks, yes? And you probably already concerned this service and these tasks as well. All right. And another hard question. What if our tasks share same data, for example, or same resources? What can we do? We also have some approaches for this. We can use uh, real time operating system features like semaphores to create these restricted sections of code where we can exclusively access, have an access to these this specific, uh, specific resources. And we have some, some protocols for these resources sharing. For example, non-preemptive protocol when uh, if we want to have an access to specific resource, we have to raise our priority of this particular task or job the high maximum level, for example, by masking interrupts. And while we are using this, this resource, we have to keep this, this uh, uh, priority level as high as it's possible. That's the idea. Priority inheritance, priority sailing is also some, some sort of uh, policy for, for manipulating your task's priorities. And there are others, of course, but they are probably well known, yeah? So you have to deal with your task's priority. That's what says your, your this classic real-time scheduling theory. But what if it will be a combination of all these factors? So a task set where some tasks are periodic, some tasks are aperiodic, some shared resources, some also, which is not listed here, like precedence constraints when a specific task has to be executed one after another. How can you deal with all of this at the same moment? Not really easy to answer. Well, for example, if we are talking about resource sharing and if you're using this uh, non-preemptive non protocol, we can just basically estimate maximum blocking time for our tasks and just extend uh, their uh, computation or execution time of this uh, estimation. This will be also pessimistic, but also safe. So in the real, real environment, this is a problem. So let me conclude, came to conclusion about the advantages and disadvantages of classic real-time scheduling theory. Well, advantage is good for periodic tasks, right? Absolutely right. Uh, we can have safe, pessimistic, but safe feasibility checks. And these feasibility checks are not complicated. You can basically uh, insert your, your parameters to specific formulas or, or execute specific algorithms, and 
this will say you yes or not, and that's it. It's not very complicated. And also there is a tool support, and you probably using one of these tools you, during your assignments, right? So there is a tool support for this classic uh, scheduling theory. It's not a big problem. But disadvantages still remain. The first one, it's too pessimistic. So even if task is sporadic, we have to think what this task is periodic. Uh, it's not very easy to work with multi-core because of these techniques like rate monotonic, EDF, and so on, they are good for, for single core. But if with multi-core, it's not that easy to estimate how it would, would, how it would be. The precedence constraints, one uh, task instance should be executed after another and vice versa. This might be also very complicated and if, if these constraints are complicated, it's hard to, to check if they are met or not. And resource sharing, of course. If this protocol for resource sharing is not obvious or this, the number of these resources is huge, is large, so then it's, it's a big problem for <clears throat> classic theory. And uh, it's also it's also have to I have to highlight, but for example, uh, what can you say about uh, both rate monotonic scheduling and data line monotonic scheduling? How you actually usually draw these uh, these uh, sch schedules for these task sets? You draw them starting from the position where all tasks been. Uh, activated at the same moment, right? Why? Why are you starting from drawing like this? Because in this paper, in 1973, it was proven, but this will be the worst case. If all tasks have been activated at the same moment, this will be the worst case for your real-time system. That's why you start from this particular um, particular case. But would it be always like this? Can you say it? No, it might be not. It might be, it might be not. It depends on the particular, the particular your system. In some systems, this task might be not, never will come to this particular worst case. So your, your estimation will be too pessimistic in this case. So lots of things have to be done. And also uh, the, the, the classic theory does not take into account how the logic, the algorithm of sporadic or aperiodic tasks activation. It just assumes the worst case, the very pessimistic case. And here in this slide you have some sources of information the one of them, the first one, is a book of uh, Giorgio Brutazzo. Um, I can say this is uh, uh, the book of all nations and times about uh, classic real-time theory. So you can go over this book and um, I strongly recommend you to, to, to take this book and to read it. The second one is more, is less theoretical, is more practical. Now, let me, let me show you some issues of worst case execution time estimation. So what's the problem actually? The problem, what well, one can say, there's no such problem. I can basically execute my, my function, my code a million times and I can measure the, the starting time of this cycle of this loop and measure the, the, the final time, then it, this loop will end, and just divide this duration. Yes, divide by a million, and I will receive approximate uh, the duration of execution of my code, and, some sort, and I will receive some sort of <coughs> uh, computation time estimation for my, for my code. Yes, absolutely right. This is absolutely correct to say it like this. But would it be a worst case execution time for your code? Hmm? How can you prove what this particular time will be the worst case? 
scanning your code execute execution take more time than you estimated like this. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Why? The first problem, program branches. You have loops in your code, you have branching operators like if in your code, and who knows which particular branch will be chosen by your code in the next execution with different input data. Who knows? So this depends, this is uh, the, the main issue of your own code. The second problem, CPU features. What are the CPU features you know? Which one of them? Cache, the first one. If uh, there will be a variable saved in the cache, the execution will be very fast, but if there will be a cache miss, the execution will be quite slow. This is one. The second, probably, you can say me a branch prediction which is very, very nice feature of CPU, which allows you it's to estimate which branch will be taken by your, your application, by your program. But unfortunately, if it will fail, the execution will be also slow. So these features are good for general purpose CPUs, like in my laptop, in your laptops, but they are not good for real-time execution. And sometimes, even in real-time systems, uh, special processors, special, special CPUs are used, which doesn't allow to have these uh, special features, like branch prediction, for example. While, why? Just because they provide some uncertainty. They provide unpredictable behavior. We don't like it. And some timing analysis. What is it? You probably already know. Your system is real-time system. Your system is composed from several tasks. And these tasks might, be, might have some shared resources and who knows how long these resources will be blocked by other uh, tasks. So this is also a problem. So you, you and, and also depends on the schedule, of course. So there might be some sort of time and anomalies which you cannot take into account by this basic end-to-end -end execution. And why did I put this fabulous picture in this slide? I, by the way, I borrowed you know, from, from one paper. I'm going to provide you a link to this paper a bit later. But what is it? It's a quite interesting chart. It shows what uh, these, these white lines, yes, you see it. You can, uh, these white lines, it's a kind of histogram which shows the execution times for your particular code. These black lines, it's a theoretical estimation. It's a real estimation of your code execution time. And you can see what this particular tail here might be not covered by your end-to-end -end execution. That's why you estimation of worst case is not safe. If you want to have a safe, you see, B said, it should be here, it should be estimated somehow. And what is it, B said? Best case, it's a best case, it's a worst case. It's a, some sort of limit for your, your uh, computation time of your particular task or module, it doesn't matter. So you can see, this is not very uh, easy to see. I can say that this chart is quite interesting because it allows you to see what, if you will find particular <laughs> input parameters or some condition for the worst case of uh, your uh, program execution, and you will try to use your end-to-end -end estimation of worst case execution time, this estimation will be safe. The problem will be how to find this condition and input data. Not very easy. And not, not in the general case, of course. Um, so how, how actually currently uh, this problem of worst case execution time estimation is solved? Well, mm, the first, there are some 
features, some, some tools which allows to do this. And these tools, they want to provide you some program, program annotations. What does it mean? Well, basically, these tools are similar to tools for, for estimation of your just uh, profiling of your code, which allows you to estimate where, where the most performance of your, your execution was accumulated in your code. So which function was called, uh, called uh, as much times as it's possible or, or whatever. So you can just estimate with these tools uh, how, many, how much time was used, utilized by, specific, by a specific function. What program annotations allows you to do? It allows you to limit, for example, the number of uh, iteration of specific loop. Because this tool, these tools, they do not allow to automatically estimate this uh, number of uh, iterations safely. So you can just limit it yourself. You can just basically provide this annotation, some specific additional information of your code to, to these tools. And there are some different approaches for estimation of worst case execution time. The first one is control flow analysis. This is an analysis of your software, of your code, of your program, which allows you to estimate the worst case of this particular code despite of, of uh, specific CPU. So it's just as usually anal a static analysis of your code. So you can just uh, uh, estimate which which path of your code may be the it contains the worst case, or uh, this might be done by uh, transformation of your of, of uh, creating first uh, uh, a tree of your code, so like you have uh, some branches of your code, and these branches might be modeled by by trees, and by trees mm -hmm. um, transformation is possible to create a final tree can, uh, uh, composed from just one leaf and uh, this leaf will contain the worst case uh, for your, your, your code. Uh, the second approach is processor behavior analysis. The first one allows you to just estimate which branch of your code is the worst or executes, its execution takes longer time and uh, the processor behavior analysis allows you to estimate how, how this code will be executed for a particular processor. It allows to, to, uh, to take into account the specific processor features like cache, like uh, its architecture and so on. I have to highlight, but this is not very useful if you trying to take into account just basic processor without other peripheral devices. So uh, in this case, it's better to say it allows you to estimate the execution for a particular platform the platform composed from a processor, memory, and other devices, because they all affect on your, your performance. And this might be done by basic static analysis methods, which is uh, modeling of this particular platform, with processor, memory, and other things, and uh, allows you to estimate theoretically the worst case execution time for your code. And uh, the last one, is, uh, is a, a real execution of your code for the uh, worst branch in your code. So this is for, for, for real code execution of your particular platform. And finally, you have to check uh, the bounds of your worst case execution time and best execution time for your code, which might be useful for, for scheduling issues. And uh, there are lots of tools for, for this. Some of these tools, they are shown in this slide, and some of these tools from this slide, they are uh, commercial tools, like, for example, um, RapidTime or Simta. And some of these tools are just uh, prototypes, university prototypes. You can download them for free and try it on your own. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. Also, 
Ait is also it's also a commercial commercial tool. And uh, the fabulous paper about the worst case execution time is the first one on this slide. It contains very big amount of, of offers, but just don't forget its name, the worst case execution time problem, overview of methods and survey of tools. Um, quite useful paper, it contains uh, basic information about all of these tools and the basic information of how these tools work. And finally, I came, I came to non-classic real-time approaches. I, I probably started before the, uh, the break and after break we will continue. I just start with it. So I will start with uh, preemptive time and petri nets. So we already highlighted problems of, of uh, classic real-time scheduling theory. And uh, let me show you how some of these problems, how some of these disadvantages might be solved by this particular approach. So any, anybody of you, uh, uh, have you ever been familiar with uh, Petri nets? Okay, so all of you or just some? Probably not everybody. So before the break, I will just show you some basic features. With this particular slide, this, this particular example, you see a model of three tasks, real-time tasks, uh, uh, with preemptive time pattern nets. Uh, the first two tasks are periodic, and the last one is sporadic task. How can you see it? With this item, this numbers 100 to 100, 150 and 50, and 100 and infinity. These are limits for, for let's say, period of these tasks. So these two, two first tasks, they have strict period, and the last one contains minimal period, but does not contain maximum period. So these uh, boxes called transitions, uh, they are annotated with some time, and this, this is the time that this, this particular transition takes. Uh, these circles are places, and these arrows are links. So the Petri, Petri uh, network is a connection of these uh, places and links. And there is a marker of this, which can be put in, inside of this place, and uh, then the market can be moved to another place. What's the rule for moving these markers? Well, for example, for this transition, uh, if all links of this transition, all inbound uh, links, this one and this one, you can see these arrows going inside of this transition. If all these uh, links go into places with markers, so this will be an active link. So currently, this is not active because only this uh, place contains marker and this one not. Right? So if this one will have a marker, it will be possible to move further. And we will move further after the short break. Thank you. All right, so let's continue after the break. And uh, before the break, I have to remind you, we, we started to deal with PetriNets and we defined what the PetriNet itself and how the transition being activated. And uh, what is this, the, this, the, the rest of this uh, diagram? This is called Motor exclusive semaphore or mutex, you know this, uh, probably you know this, this um, uh, part of, uh, of quite common part, quite common uh, technique of real-time system software or at least uh, parallel software development technologies. So this, uh, this is a model of mutex, so motor execu execution uh, exclusive semaphore. So uh, this, this is a model of how we can 
define some sort of uh, critical section inside of your code where two tasks, task one and task two, share the same data. We're trying to get an access to the same data. And now I'm going to go to this, uh, to the tool support for this Petri Nets. And uh, there's a link for a particular tool. You can download it, try it yourself. And I'm going to demonstrate how this particularly works. So unfortunately, this is in my virtual PC because uh, I just don't want to work on my 64, x64 machine. So I have to use it in the 32. Okay, so you can see the same picture, the same, the same uh, PetriNet, and uh, I can just basically show you how it works. So I can just uh, start from scratch, and I need to show you everything, every, every, every place of this model, and this allows me to just continuously execute it. So you can see how, how all of these um, positions have uh, been uh, marked with these markers and how, how these markers are moved across this uh, model. This shows basically that <laughs> this particular model works correctly. So you can, with this uh, theory of pattern nets and the theory of traps, you can estimate which number of states might be there the transitions between the states, and you can just basically go through all these possible paths and check if these paths are feasible, if everything is okay. So how would it look if, for example, there will be some sort of deadlock or um, some hangs? Um, it will look like in a particular position will be a accumulation of, of these markers. So. Uh, in one position will be, might be more markers than one. It might be two, three, ten, or even a hundred of them, if it would be possible. And for example, if, if in this position we will have more than one marker, that means that this uh, UTX is blocked and it doesn't allow us to go to this place. So this is some sort of deadlock. So this, this allows to, to see how how it might be done. Okay, let's go, let's go back to our lecture. Another approach, non-classic approach for real-time systems modeling and verification is based on automata. Well, automata is, uh, you're probably already familiar with this term. Uh, it's also a graph uh, equipped with uh, time, so a time and graph and uh, what can it be used for? So basically, with classic theory, you modeled your real-time system as a combination of tasks with some sort of parameters for each task and so on. And you just try to model how this task set will be executed. But how this might be connected to some sort of graph? You have to define this link. And this link is not obvious. Because this automata, this graph, has to define some special graphs for each particular task you have. How can, we be, how can this be done? Very easy. Remember, your task in the operating system can be in one or several states, right? There are some transitions between these states. Is it graph? Apparently, yes. So you can put this graph in this model and tool, and you will have a model of one particular task. What else do you need to model the task execution? You need a model of your scheduler. You need a model of additional parameters of your task set, like um, dependencies between tasks, like resources sharing, uh, and some other things. So you can try to, to to put all of these parameters into this uh, chart or graph modeling tool. And uh, how can you check if this works correctly? You need a tool that allows you to see all possible paths, all possible 
uh, evolutions of your graph, all the tr uh, possible transitions of your graph be checked for. And this might be done with simulation. And it, at each simulation step, it's possible to check some particular properties of your graph that you also can define which properties they can be. For example, you can check if there will be a deadlock or not. What is a deadlock? It means what particular task or doesn't matter, any graph was stuck in specific uh, position and it cannot go anywhere from this position. Uh, or what, what else can it be? This might be like a particular task or a particular graph had come to the position where it's not supposed to be, to the wrong position, to the error position. That is also can be checked. So by modeling, by first estimating this space of uh, possible states of your graph, by defining these properties, safety properties, this might be properties for scheduling, this might be properties for your functionality or something else, and by simulation, and uh, checking these properties on each simulation step, you can define strictly, but during your simulation, everything was correctly, was correct. What else can we say about this approach? Of course, this is less pessimistic than classic approach. Why? Because we are able to simulate more complicated, behavior of our system than just basic tasks with all, with all tem timing parameters. We can simulate the logic of our system. Also, it's not very complicated, or it's less complicated than with, with uh, classic theory to work with multi-core, to work with uh, shared resources and uh, precedence constraints, for example. Why? Because, for example, precedence constraint is possible to specify as a special uh, invariance or parameters of your model and check on every, every step of your simulation. With uh, multi-core, well, oh, and uh, resource sharing, you can define lots of resources and each resource may be modeled by a specific dedicated uh, graph with some sort of additional functionality. And uh, it's not a big problem to, to, to check all of these, all of these uh, things together. The only one problem is the complexity of the resulting model. If this model is too complicated, then the number of states will be very, very huge. And uh, the performance of your model in PC will be not enough to model all these situations, unfortunately. That's why you have to simplify your model in some cases. And another problem is feasibility check. You have to rely on estimation of all possible states of your graph. If you did not specify it exclusively, so there might be some other states that were missed. So your feasibility check is not correct. It's not safe. So that's how it actually works. And uh, again, I have to show you another tool. Uh, a tool called Times, nice name for a, for a time estimation or time properties checking tool. There's a link. This is a uh, this is a free tool for academic use, and uh, it's the, I really like this tool. Why do I like it? it this is because this is a, this tool is a, takes best from two of these approaches: classic approach and from, from uh, chart graph, graph uh, approach. Why? Because it allows me to model periodic tasks as usual. I do not have to specify any specific uh, graph for normal periodic task. I can model them as, as, as usual. I can just put parameters of this task and say, well, just use rate model and scheduling for this task and that's it, okay? But for non-periodic tasks, it allows me to specify a graph uh, which is a model of states of my software and 
assign which particular state, which particular place of this graph has to be assigned to this particular task activation. So for example, if uh, this graph will go to this specific position, this uh, asynchronous task will be activated. Yes, yes. Also, it's possible to define precedence constraints very easily. So you can basically just say, this task should be executed after this one. Or this one will be executed only if these two tasks will be finished. Right? All right. Or this one will be executed after this, or this will be finished. Interesting stuff. Uh, it's also possible to check feasibility of the schedule. So it's possible to check if all, all uh, task instances will be finished before their deadlines. It's also possible to define, uh, to, to verify the model, not just to check the its schedule if it's feasible. It's possible to check if some other properties, some functionality properties are correct. So if, for example, there's supposed to be, uh, some parameter should be higher than 100 during the execution of your model at some certain, certain point of time, but just for, for a very, very um, short time. You can basically say with a verification, is there any time when this particular parameter higher than 100? And if it will be, it will be checked, yes or not. And finally, it allows you to generate code. Unfortunately, this is not very useful from my point of view because uh, Times Tool allows to generate code for uh, Lego OS, as far as I remember. Not very well-known operating system. Okay, let me show how how it works. So this is Times Tool. What can you see here? You see, can you see it really? Yes. You see four tasks. Three of them are periodic tasks. You see them. You, what is B? Behavior. B means periodic. C means Activated, uh, you can say the control task, it's called like control task. Uh, priority, uh, computing or worst case execution time, deadline, and period. Of course, for control task, there is no such term as period. Uh, what else can we see here? We he see here some sort of definition of this, uh, of this model. So we have three periodic tasks. It's just a, these boxes are just link, uh, labels. But this one is a definition of specific, spe uh, specific template instance. And uh, this template is automation A. You see it? And it's defined in this type. And it also defines some special parameter for this uh, template. This parameter is five. Recall this number, five. Uh, what else? We have here definition for all tasks. We can browse for all, all of these tasks, and you can see with, that each task is assigned with specific code, which is C language code. It allows to uh, assign specific parameters, to sp specific values to, to variables used in your code. What else can we see here? Precedence constraints. Wow. So we can put here task node for a particular task. We can put here and connector and say, like task C have to be uh, executed after Oops. like this. Is it nice? I think so, but let me remove this. <laughs> and uh, finally, automation. This is graph, quite simple one. This is a model, very, very simplified model of, of my software, and uh, has initial state and three additional state, states, and uh, in these states, in this location, uh, control task will be activated. And uh, the parameter, remember, the parameter for my uh, template is 
n. The number will be assigned to this n is phi, and this n will go here to this uh, particular link, and this means that uh, this will be a guard condition which, which says how many times or in which, in which uh, particular uh, condition this, this transition will be activated. And you will see it currently, then I will simulate the execution of this task set. So you can see three tasks being executed, they are periodic. And you can see how it works for task A. The first, let's say, planning period was without this task and later it comes. So where is the number five? Who can answer? So the five is a, yes, that's right. Five is number of uh, task A uh, activations. Is it nice? Yeah, it's nice. So you can see if it was, uh, uh, how it how it works, and you can basically check if uh, the uh, feasibility role for the schedule is kept. You can see it. Yes, it just basically checks all possible um, uh, scheduling uh, schedules for this particular task set, and we can even see the worst case uh, response time for each task. So you can check if it's, it's if it's okay. Quite nice tool, but unfortunately, it's, uh, this tool also contains some disadvantages. Uh, for example, it uh, allows the model just one single processor, it's not suitable for multi-core, unfortunately. So it's not perfect either, but it's better. Okay, so let me show you the final tool, final tool for today. Uh, final tool for real-time uh, schedule modeling. This is Upal tool. Have anybody heard about this tool? Of you? No. Okay. So this is this tool is related to Times tool because it was developed in uh, in the same uh, team, Sweden, and uh, perhaps it even uh, shares some 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 portions of code, but uh, this is more general too. It does not contain uh, this Gantt chart visualizer of your task execution. It does not allow you to specify task, periodic task with all of these parameters as you're familiar with. So it requires from you to define special graphs for each task and to define a scheduler yourself. And this is not very easy to be done. But let me show you how it can be been <coughs> completed. For example, uh, this is task model. What can you see? Uh, this is initial state. It's quite, see, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, this is so-called mm, computed state, as far as I remember. Oh no, uh, committed state. C means committed. This means what uh, the task will not uh, gonna last in this state for a long time. It will just come to this state and immediately should go somewhere else to another place. It should wait for an offset. I mean, uh, the initial phase should be kept uh, by this state. It should wait for dependency if there will be some sort of um, um, concurrency for resources, so we should wait for a specific resource to be um, um, released by other tasks. Uh, this, uh, this state means what the task is ready for execution and it should be, and it should last there until the worst case execution time has violated. And if, uh, uh, in, and, and if the deadline in this state will be missed, then this means what 
the task will be in a raw state. And if it, any task is in a raw state in your, uh, in your model, it means that the schedule is not feasible. The deadline is missed. And uh, final states means what uh, if task is finally completed, it might be if its task is periodic, it should be uh, repeated again. If it's not periodic, it should be finally in the last state when it will not go anywhere. So it's just one time activity. For all of these tasks, we define several parameters like initial offset, you can see it, uh, minimal period and maximum period. You can see it's already more flexible than usual classic theory because it allows you to specify not a specific range, a uh, specific value, but a range for, for uh, task period. Of course, offset inside of this period, a deadline, best case execution time and worst case execution time, also not classic approach, and uh, used resource. It might be CPU, for example, if it's multi-core, if you want to, uh, to make, enable your tasks to, for concurrency for CPUs, or maybe share of memory, it depends. And the priority. Priority if, if you have a preemptive schedule, of course. Uh, what's a resource model in this case might be done? A resource might be basically in two states. Ready or idle or in use, occupied. Here they are, the initial state is idle, resource is not, um, uh, is, is, uh, is ready to be captured and in use. These two states, they are just for implementation of logic and so this might be if task tries to acquire this resource and if this resource is empty or not empty and so on. So it just, uh, it's just, it's needed because each resource is accomplished to a specific queue for all tasks which uh, waiting for for this resource to be released. That's why there are some additional committed states here. And let me show you how it works. Let me show you how it works. So first, uh, this is the same, uh, the same uh, graph for resource. Next, this is the same graph for task. Um, three additional graphs that are quite simple. The first one for FIFO scheduling policy. You can use this policy in uh, Unix operating systems, you know it. Um, FPS uh, scheduling policy means fixed priority scheduling. So this might be useful for both rate monotonic scheduling and deadline monotonic scheduling. And finally, EDF which is more complicated because it requires to estimate which task is closer to its deadline and which task has to be, uh, which priority uh, of, of which task should be um, engaged. And there are some additional declarations accomplished to each graph. Well, to the resource, like uh, uh, remove or add task to the specific resource, this is an implementation, basic implementation of queue. The syntax is quite similar to C language, you can see it. Uh, declarations for tasks is just some, some functions for uh, task parameters, access and uh, definition of some properties, like is it completed or not. With FIFO, nothing is added. With FPS is added like just put a specific buffer to a uh, specific task to buffer to, to, to the queue for execution. And with EDF, it's a bit different because it allows to calculate which tasks should be engaged with priority. The global declarations of the whole model includes some structures and data types, and this is the main part of it. This is the definition of task set. You can see five tasks five tasks and uh, the first parameter is initial offset, it's zero for all of them. Minimum and maximum period are other two parameters, there are 20 for all of them. 
So all tasks share the same period and it's stable. An offset inside of period is also zero. A deadline is equal to period, quite simple one. But best case and worst case execution time, you can see these parameters are uh, stable for all of these tasks. So the only one basically is done here. And uh, resource is the almost last one. This is a uh, identifier of the resource. The zero means what uh, this will be a CPU zero. The one means this is the next CPU. So we have two CPUs. And the number two means that this is not a CPU, this is a special P4 buffer. So the last task is accomplished with P4 operations. And the last one is priority. Priority is the same for all of them. Also, you can see here additional definition. This is task precedence constraints. So I will not go deep down here. I will just say what zero means, but uh, a task I and J means the number of row and the column is not dependent, and one means they are dependent. One should be after another. The rest is not very important. If you would like, you, I can show it a bit later after the lecture because otherwise we will not have enough time. And uh, finally, let me show how it works. This probably might be the most interesting part of it. So, let me show you. You can see there's a, there are several uh, graphs. This is for task zero, task one, task two, task three, and task four. And you can see how these tasks leave. So you can see the transitions between states of these tasks. And uh, there are two processors, two CPUs, zero and one. And you can see how these tasks are uh, utilizing these processors and the bus connection between them. So you can see how it actually works and you can see the state of each task and you can try to wait how long it will take to check every, every, every state, but this, this will be quite a long time. For this reason, I will just basically stop it. And uh, verifier is a very interesting thing. It allows to check if all tasks will not get into the error state. Let me check it. Yeah, property is satisfied. So this schedule is feasible. So that's how it works. Of course, you can see this definition of task is not very easy, but it allows you to have more flexibility. It gives you more features, but it's more complicated in the same moment. So nothing is perfect. Okay, so that was the last two um, I, was, I, was, I wanted to show you today, and uh, I'm moving to the last section of my presentation, of our lecture, uh, connected with um, some history of um, or research case of earliest deadline as late as possible, scheduled an algorithm. So let me go into this section. So what is ADL? As I said, is earliest deadline as late as possible. That's the abbreviation, EDL. It's an opposite to EDF, where it's earliest deadlines uh, first, yes? So how, how does it work? How, what's the idea of EDO? The idea is very similar to normal students' behavior, to schedule tasks as late as possible, but not missing a deadline. So if one would want to create an assignment, probably it will be the last night before the deadline, but the deadline will be not missed, right? Uh, of course, this might be a quite funny uh, description of this, of this uh, uh, scheduling algorithm, but uh, it provides a very interesting feature of this algorithm. In every period, if every planning period, if this is for, for, for example, for periodic tasks, in the beginning of this period will be quite big portion of time 
can be used, what, what can be used as a slack time or other, other things. What are these things might be? Just guess. What can it be? This slack time might be utilized, for example, for aperiodic tasks. And you can just basically estimate if there will be enough time, slack time with your scheduling scheme for, for this particular um, aperiodic task and you can define an algorithm for acceptance test for this task. And there's another approach, you can also use it. Uh, you can use this EDL uh, scheduling scheme for, for example, fault tolerance because it allows you to utilize this slack time for some sort of backup tasks. And this, this particular algorithm was defined in this paper. You can see quite a long time ago, uh, 1989. And... Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for a question. <laughs> um, I can say what uh, if if you would like to to conversate about particular example of utilization of, of using this uh, this algorithm we can do it after the lecture but uh, I'm, I'm just I just want to show you a particular example of how this can be used and of course you can define me a special special case where this might be not very useful but uh, but let me just show you for where it might be useful finally so I just basically highlighted the idea of how it might be used of course, it's not very uh, feasible everywhere. Not a general case, of course. In some cases, it might be quite useful. It depends. So what's what's the example of EDL schedule? It might be better if you will look first in here. So you can see <clears throat> three tasks. These are parameters of these tasks. So the first one is a period. The second one is computation time or worst case execution time. And the last one is deadline. You can see. <clears throat> Each of these tasks has a deadline a bit less than its period, and uh, you can see how, how it will be with EDL schedule. And, uh, and the initial researcher of who could propose, researchers who proposed this schedule, schedule algorithm, they, they showed that the slack time will, in the beginning of this period will be the biggest one. And uh, According to this estimation, it's possible to check if there will be enough slack time for 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 acceptance tests for specific sporadic tasks or or a uh, 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 periodic tests. So these are the basic applications. Well, you can specify periodic tasks, scheduling them by EDO, and you can define a specific uh, acceptance test algorithm for this case, acceptance test. And uh, the result here is well known, it is the advanced late survey. So you can even find the description of this survey in, in books and, and there will be a link to this particular pa paper which I showed in the previous slide. And another implementation is fault tolerance. Um, so uh, in the same paper, authors define so-called deadline mechanism. What does it mean? It means what if, if we will try to implement two versions of the same task, some sort of design diversity or recovery blocks approach where we, we provide two versions of the same tasks implemented in different ways, maybe in different algorithms. And one of them called primary version, which is might be complicated, but provides very accurate results. 
and uh, because of this uh, complexity, it doesn't allow us to, to say what it doesn't allow us to say what this task will be reliable. So it might be finished with some sort of uh, exception, for example. And uh, uh, primary uh, alternative version of the same task is so-called simplified, maybe simplified version, a bit simplified algorithm which provides us safe but not so precise results. So you, you can schedule these, these two versions of the same task with different priorities and you can say, for example, <clears throat> if, if uh, alternative task will be scheduled with a higher priority or if a uh, primary version of, of uh, the same task was finished correctly, there is no need to execute this alternative version. But if execution time of specific primary task was violated, so if, if it misses its deadline, it should be preempted by its alternative version. So the alternative versions of the task might be scheduled by EDL. And primary versions might be scheduled by any other, other scheduling algorithm. So that's, that's how this like time is used in this case. Of course, it might be acceptable or not acceptable. It depends on specific case study. So that's the idea. That was the initial proposal. Acceptance of sporadic tasks or a periodic, a periodic task and uh, full tolerance with deadline mechanism. How it was uh, developed further? Uh, there was additional uh, extension of deadline monotonic, uh, deadline mechanism. Don't, don't miss it with the deadline monotonic, sorry. Uh, there was a proposal, proposed uh, a backwards rate monotonic algorithms, um, uh, scheduling algorithm, it's similar to EDF, uh, but uh, if EDF or EDL it's a dynamic priority scheduling algorithm, but backwards or BRM uh, is static priority scheduling algorithm <clears throat> where priority has been uh, rearranged in opposite order than in usual rate monotonic. And uh, the idea was how to, how to schedule the same tasks as late as possible using rate monotonic. That's the idea. So, uh, Eddie is pretty the same as was proposed in the previous paper, but in the later research results, it was shown that it's also possible to use this scheduling scheme for, for uh, similar fault tolerance tasks, false fault tolerance solutions. So this might be done. And uh, there were proposed in these two papers different, different algorithms which allow us to, to schedule different um, task with different algorithms. Some of them refining each other, which allows to, 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 to postpone execution of less number of uh, alternative tasks or primary tasks, it depends. And finally, I'm not getting out of time. So you can see how, how, how the basic idea was involved. It, it, uh, it was shown how, how basically it was uh, formed with even uh, classic approach of real-time real scheduling theory and some other interesting features and modeling tools for non-classic approaches, they probably would be useful or at least interesting for all of you. And uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask and thank you for your attention. All right, questions? <laughs> Sometime back, back where? Uh, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, I, I just want to rephrase your question. I, I just wanted to, to say it myself, and if, if I, just let me know if I understand you right. So you have uh, one or two cores, CPU cores, and you propose to, to use uh, for one core uh, one scheduling algorithm and for another core another scheduling algorithm. Is it allowed? Of course, yes. You can do it. Okay, so the question was, is it possible to assign one core for a periodic task with one, some sort of scheduling algorithm using them and checking the feasibility probably, yes, and another core for sporadic task on, uh, or a periodic task probably, yeah? Well, of course, it's also possible, but uh, perhaps this will be not very optimal. Why it's not optimal? Uh, because it depends on your task set. Because if your task set, well, I mean your periodic task allows you to have uh, some sort of slack time which can be utilized for uh, a periodic task handling. So why don't you use it? And uh, restrict to just one core. Well, of course, it depends on your implementation, and you have to figure out if you want to use classic theory. Uh, so you have to rely on specific server, fixed priority server or dynamic priority server. There are some implementation of this that are described in literature. You can check which one of them will be more useful for you, and you should uh, implement it in the right order. And also, you have to check if your your task set, if your tasks are feasible with this, uh, with this approach, because there might be, not, not, for example, not enough slack time to share. So this is not very, very easy, not very uh, obvious to say it in a general way. There are some guidelines, so just follow them. That's it. But if you want to, if you want to use a non-classic approach, it allows you to Additionally, take into account not just uh, the pessimistic behavior of your task set or your tasks at all. At all. It allows you to take into account <laughs> the exact behavior of your task. You can model in which cases, in which, uh, in which uh, particular uh, so-called ifs, this task will be activated or not. And you can check if it's possible still with one CPU or not, for example. So it depends. There are some benefits of using two CPUs. There are, there's a benefit to use more CPUs. In some cases, it's not possible to limit just one CPU. But uh, the more complicated hardware you will have, the more problems with this hardware you will get. Yeah, it's obvious. So, of course you can. It allows you. It, it, it's up to you how to utilize your course. I would like to have as less as possible, of course. Yes, your question? Uh, I'm sorry, which one of particular, uh, this, this, you want to ask about this or, or, or what?
Okay, I realize. Okay, okay, I realize your question. Yes, of course, this, this particular schedule is not really easy to get when your time is going from left to right of this chart. But can you do this for periodic task set? If, you, if parameters of all of your tasks are defined, you can have a, you can estimation of planning period or hyper period, and you can start from the hyper period, which is 36 now in this case, and go on back, just calculating activation times for each particular task instance. It's possible to do it like this. So you have to rotate time in a reverse order and then you have to rotate it in the right order. Interesting. Not very easy to implement, but possible. All right, any other questions? Okay, no any questions, so it's almost dark outside. Thank you very much for your attention, thank you very much for your questions again, and. Uh, this particular lecture and presentation will be uh, in uh, YouTube, so you can you will have an ability to, to watch it again, and uh, the presentation slides will be available in Moodle. Thank you very much again. Thank you.